Right, brilliant. We're joined by Reynu, a very old friend of mine who I've known since we were at law school together, uh, in this series of The Elevator, where, as all the viewers will know, we're looking at people who have not only just managed to elevate themselves and break through various uh, ceilings, but also have helped in elevating others. Now, Rainey's background is a barrister, uh, qualified in the UK, and also qualified on the New York bar. She has not only managed to become a lawyer here, but in the States, and a partner at a US law firm, which in itself will be difficult enough, were it not for the fact that she's dual qualified in the UK, then she moves to the US and then has moved back here and on top of all of that is a mum of two lovely kids so Rain, it's dead easy isn't it the whole fact the fight the struggle it's all finished yeah there's no more male dominated professions uh, uh, it's easy being a mum and, and and getting to the top of your profession all straightforward isn't it thank you Alpesh. thank you for uh putting it into succinct terms as only you can but um, easy, no. Enjoyable and challenging, yes, absolutely. Um, I think I should probably be very clear from the get-go. Uh, I didn't do it all at once. So I had quite a staged um, way in which I was able to pursue my career and then my family. And uh, I think in many ways that has been uh, a key ingredient in my own personal journey and also my ability to balance or chase in some ways that elusive work-life um, um, happiness and satisfaction. Uh, well, this, that's an important point because that issue of pace, I mean, when I speak to my own wife, you know, as well, um, th there can sometimes be this pressure that, oh my God, I'm not moving fast enough or I'm in the slow lane. How do you cope with that? I think I'll give you by way of background. Um, my circumstances were such when we graduated together, as you remember, and uh, shortly thereafter, I left the bar and went to the US, um, initially just for a one year period to pursue a master's degree. Um, but once I got there, I found I really enjoyed being there. I liked the challenges. I liked the different kind of legal system. So I had very supportive parents and extended um, uncles and aunts in the US who were very keen to help me set myself up in a way that I could pursue opportunities that arose in a different country. So I, I certainly don't overlook their influence. But at that point, um, I had sort of arrived in a brand new country and felt like it was up to me to decide whether I sink or I swim. Um, I didn't go there because I had a job. I went there to study and I had to find my own path. And I was very keen, I think, to, to work in New York. And so I, I found a way to do that. I met people when I was in Washington. I networked. You were there for a sort of a, a period. We, inter, uh, we overlapped our experiences in Washington. And uh, I think that experience gave me the confidence to take the first step and to then move to, to New York and to um, a bigger law firm, a US law firm that perhaps wasn't looking for somebody with no experience that I had, um, but was willing, because I think of my background, to say, we'll give you a chance. Um, Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, to, 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 to sort of, you know, to cut a long story short, that was when the journey began for me. And uh, it, it, New York was a very different experience and one in which work was the dominant factor for me. And it was so for, for a long time. And that came with, you know, challenges and also with opportunity. Rainy, the old song goes, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. You're, again, you're making it sound a little bit easy. You, you had to network. Um, let's not forget, forget gender. Let's not forget ethnicity. How did that come about? That How did you overcome, when I'm going to assume the struggles were a lot more difficult than if you were, let's say, white middle-aged man with, uh, 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 with a history of generations in, in the legal profession. What, ke what kept you going? I think generally by nature, I'm quite strong-willed and stubborn. I come from quite a strong line in my family of, of powerful women. Um, so rightly or wrongly, I think I was more pig-headed in my pursuit of wanting to do something that 
appeal to me, to work for me. I didn't start with a plan saying I have to work for X law firm or Y law firm because I didn't go there at a time or at the right point in my career to go through milk rounds and get uh, onto summer associate programs. So a lot of their junior associate needs had already been met. So I did have to network. I had to network with people that I met who who recognized that I was ambitious and that I was interested in pursuing a career in the US. And uh, I have to say that the law obviously is very male dominated, but I don't think it suggests necessarily that men won't help you in your career if you are shown to be committed to pursuing a path. So I was very lucky in that I was able to establish mentorship relationships quite early on while I was at, um, at, at, at the States. And um, I don't think it harmed to have an English accent and to be slightly different than the one of the mill um, people that they saw. So I did manage to find a foothold first in Washington and then I managed to transfer to, to New York. And uh, after that, it really was just a case of slogging it away. That was the environment in New York law firms in those days. You worked the hours and as long as you worked the hours, you were looked upon favorably. Um, you know, sponsorship came along, I think, as a result of being someone who was always there first thing in the morning, leaving late at night, pulling long hours, working all nighters. And, uh, you know, that, that, that was the sort of the, the ingredients that, uh, that I think went into the mix. Um, I'd like to say it could be different now, but I think when your model is the billable hour, yeah. you really have to be putting in those billable hours. And I was able to do that at that stage in my career because I was not committed in any other way to anything else. I was on my own and I had all the time in the world to devote to my work. Um, Ray, if you're talking to somebody today thinking of joining the legal profession, and I'm going to put to one side, well, no, we can talk about, you know, I, I don't want to make it stereotypical and say a young girl or a young uh, ethnic minority girl, but let's just say anybody looking to join the legal profession, what would your advice be? I think that a lot of the things that we associate with the legal profession. So intellectual ability, um, the, the desire to look at things and analyze and to focus on, on a problem and find a creative way to solve. All of those things are important. But I think underlying all of that, you have to have a passion. You have to have a passion that this is something that you want to do. Because like in every job, there are good days, there are bad days. There are good months and bad months. There are good years and bad years. So you have to have something to sustain you throughout that period. And I think without that, it's like any other profession that requires a huge amount of personal sacrifice. You need to know why you're doing it because it then becomes very challenging to withhold or to withstand rather the, the, the things that will happen to everybody in their career. There are ups and downs for everyone. And uh, I think that plus um, stamina, you need stamina. Um, you need to be able to show up and every day repeat the same kinds of things, not necessarily seeing the fruits of your labor immediately. But um, you know, it's, it's no different than any other challenging profession that requires you give a lot of yourself. Renu, this whole series is called The Elevator after people who've not just managed to elevate themselves and, uh, you know, and do extraordinary things such as you in the legal profession, but also who send the elevator down and help others. What have you done uh, uh, which has helped other, uh, but either within the law or I know, for instance, you were on the Council for, on Foreign Relations in the US as well, outside of the law as well to uplift other professionals or non-professionals? So I think when I worked in the US, I was at a very small boutique reinsurance arbitration firm, which meant we did a lot of sophisticated work, but um, we weren't a huge operation. And within that purview, you know, we had about maybe 200 lawyers at that stage. So by today's international standards, it, it wasn't a large firm. Within the purview of that, when I first started, there were no female partners. Um, and when I became a partner, I was probably the third person who was a female to, to make a partner. So we were few and far between, and we had very few role models to look up to in that way. Um, so what 
I did and some of the ladies that made partners slightly before I did, what we tried to do was to provide informal mentorship to the ladies who were joining after us. Um, there was no model. There was nothing at that point. We were quite a cutthroat firm in the sense that our remuneration model was very much eat what you kill. So the fact of the matter was that if you worked the hours and you brought in the profits, you were remunerated accordingly, regardless of your gender or your, your ethnic background. It was America and uh, the, the, the dollar spoke for us all. Um, so in that environment in particular, I think it's quite hard to provide and to set up um, programs that really give women the space and the opportunity to look at different ways of combining being a woman in a male dominated industry with their own profiles and their own versions of what success looks like. So informally we did quite a lot, but I think the natural thing was that in the industry I was in and certainly in reinsurance arbitration, there were very, very few women and uh, it was quite difficult for women who were joining who also wanted to manage a family at the same time to feel inspired by looking at the women partners none of whom were married none of whom had families and to feel that that was a place where they felt comfortable so that was a challenge i think um i'd like to say things have changed but even when i left my firm which subsequently became a lot larger i was one of 13 women equity partners so it's still a very small proportion and uh, I think the remuneration model had a lot to do with that because it does require you to make a sacrifice um, in terms of your time. You cannot be doing both at the same time. So um, that, that really was, was the situation. Now, outside of my law firm career, I did do a lot of work through the New York Bar Association. I chaired a committee on international security affairs. It was something that Coming back to the point I made earlier about having passion to drive you, sometimes the days are long and frustrating in a law firm and you need something else to be able to give you the buoyancy to wake up and face another day. And so I did have an opportunity very early on to get involved with the committee and uh, after 9-11 happened, I became um, the, the chair of that committee. So it elevated my profile externally from my, my law firm where I was another associate to um, a situation where I was suddenly meeting with quite important people and um, discussing issues on behalf of the New York Bar to do with laws that could be implemented to deal with the security threat that started to be recognized in the US from terrorism. They, they'd been very blinded to that fact up until the point of 9-11. So in that context, and I did get to meet many, many more women, both senior to me, more experienced than me, and also those coming up in the ranks. And uh, obviously we had many more opportunities to collaborate, but the sticking point I think always, and more so in America, was the fact that work-life balance in those days was something that wasn't really talked about openly. You were required to put on a front to show that you could do the work as well as anybody could, and put your personal life to one side. And uh, I'd like to say, I think that is changing, certainly from friends I have who work in the UK and in different industries, for example, where, where you're not required to do that. There is a, an acknowledgement now that it's important for people to have a balance in their life. Now, how you practically come about finding that will vary from person to person, but at least there now is a recognition that a life that is too heavily influenced only by work isn't something that is going to be acceptable to to a lot of people. Yeah, or good for the firm either. Um, right. Um, Renny, you said something there which I think um, is almost one of the sort of, if there are secrets, let's put it that way, to success. Having those outside interests, those networking bodies, now we're lucky enough to have you on the advisory board for the City Hindus Network, but having those external bodies, those interests outside of work, which then also helps you network and feeds into your your work. I mean, what did you do? Did you just go out and apply to those? Um, similarly, when you talked about um, mentoring, There'll be a lot of people listening to this saying, well, you know, I need a mentor. What's the best way? Because very often there aren't formal networks. You just find them on LinkedIn and just try and just get the right person. Uh, uh, what would you adv advise? I think 
in this day and age, because it is much more of an understood concept, the, the difference between a mentor and a sponsor, I think it does behoove an individual to try to go and search for one if one doesn't present itself. Um, that being said, I, I was very lucky in, in my career that the very first person I worked for, um, who ended up being my partner, was somebody who took a real interest. He had a very old school approach to the idea of training somebody to be a lawyer. It was very holistic, not just you need to do this work for me and I'm going to put it in as my own. He had a very big interest in trying to, to teach and to be that mentor. And, and I think nowadays when everybody is so busy, it's very difficult to find people like that naturally because everyone has their own timeline to, to adhere to. So I, I would encourage people to, to make specific inquiries with people because a lot of people want to help. It's just opportunities don't necessarily present themselves um, unless you are, you are looking for them actively, I think. That being said, I mean, I was, I was lucky and it was that same partner who had you know, brought me into the law firm who said, you should look to do something else, look to contribute, to give something back. Law is not just a one way street. You need to think of it as a dynamic situation where lawyers can influence the law. And so um, he encouraged me very much to join a committee and he said, do not make it about the same work that you do inside the law firm. So that's why I chose international security affairs. I was interested in politics, as you know, and current affairs, and it was something that sounded interesting to me. And when I got there, it was filled with people who had a very vast array of experiences in the legal profession. They weren't, mainly, they were not private practice lawyers. They were, because I was in New York, they were legal advisors to the UN. They were um, from different countries, from different backgrounds. Some of them worked with the Pentagon. Some of them worked with the Justice Department. So I also got exposure to a broader community um, within the New York arena that I never would have got to if all I'd done was stay at my firm. And then through that and through having leadership positions and taking on challenges, I was, you know, I was quite young when I became the first female chair of that committee. It, it had been quite illustrious. Cyrus Vance had been a prior chair of that. And I, I really did, you know, think, how was I going to do it? Because uh, I was quite young, had no experience. But I took it, you know, on the chin and thought, let's make a go of it. And when 9-11 happened, there just were many, many people who were interested in committing time to that topic. And we influenced a lot of the laws that were being made at that time in response, the, the terrorism response laws. And, uh, and also, you know, we did some interesting things with the American Bar Association that uh, involved, you know, drafting laws for Afghanistan after the U.S. had invaded. We did a paper that was very timely on whether or not congressional authorization was required for the invasion of Iraq by George W. Bush. And we submitted our paper, we were involved in a dialogue and it resulted in a reversal of the administration's position as to whether they needed congressional authorization. So I met a huge number of very influential and fascinating individuals in that. I, I was the committee chair and I was managing a roster of very accomplished and senior people in the New York legal environment. And we had a fantastic time coming up with different ways of doing things. But, um, you know, that again was a, a situation where it built my confidence in a different way. I would be sitting in my office and getting phone calls put through by the receptionist from ambassador so-and-so is calling to speak to you. And I think in a way that helped to elevate my profile within the law firm. Um, you never can be sure. And there are challenges I think that come up in every lawyer's career as to when they reach the next level of promotion, when they you know, are on partnership track. And, and I don't think anybody ever gets to become a partner when they themselves think they should. It's always a longer process than you think. But I'd like to think that having that respite and having that ability to do something that you could feel was making a difference, that was making a contribution, that was something that spoke to a passion in you was, was something that I think was a key ingredient in my success in my legal career within the law firm. And, right. and that's why I applaud what you're doing here and, and everyone on, on the Hindu network, because it is important to find somewhere to challenge, to, excuse me, to channel those different instincts to give something back. 
it's interesting, Rene, I can hear it in your voice when you're talking about politics and international affairs, the passion. And I guess the message is to those people who are listening or starting out in their careers is to hunt for that, is to find that where you want to just get that out to other people as well as you've done. I know from our time in Washington, um, yeah. uh, you know, when we were dealing with politics and we were working together on, on various side projects, um, how much fun it was. And I guess it's tapping into that. You're doing some phenomenal insights. Is there anything, because I'm mindful of billable hours and I'm a bit worried about the clock. Uh, is there any insight, anything in closing which you haven't already said you want to uh, uh, message to everyone listening? I think my, you know, after doing this for a few years now and then subsequently at a later stage in life, you know, I, I did found and start a family and, uh, and I carried on working at a manic pace even after doing that. I, I, you know, I had two nannies and I would take my kids on tow to trials in New York. I did all of that. And there is this pressure. There is this pressure for women to be seen to be having it all and to be able to juggle everything. And my, my sort of only takeaway from that is it's very difficult. It still is very difficult. And I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. And so to me, the most important alignment that one needs to find is the alignment between one's internal values and the external reality of one's life. I think there are periods in life where everything is in sync. I remember when I was working in New York, I was single woman and I could work all the hours God sends. There was complete alignment. I loved my work. I loved the pace. I loved the travel. I loved everything. I loved all the, the things that I could do external to my work that we touched upon with the Council on Foreign Relations, with the UN. It was fantastic. I should add, I had still, children. but Rainy, you still made time for friends. I remember whenever I popped over to New York, you always made time. I don't want people to think you were just a workaholic with no life. <laughs> it's always time for that. But, but when you have children, it does, it does change the equation to some extent. And, and I think every person and every family has to make the choice that works for them. And it may be different at different points in time. I was tremendously lucky that I had a very, very strong support system. My parents, my mom, who was a doctor, so she'd always been a fabulous you know, role model and a person who made me believe and know just by her example that Anything's possible if you put your mind to it. My father, who had always encouraged me to do what I had to do, they've supported me very much with my children. Um, but still, there came a point in time where I had to say, where are my values and what is the external reality of my life? And is there an alignment? And in that situation, I took my foot off the gas at work and decided to construct a reality that's more based on my family as the the foundation point and create around that but for every person it's going to be different and there's no right and no wrong and i think the pressure that people put upon themselves needs to be looked at in that uh, context Renu, thank you very much. I think, I think everything you said is going to be invaluable. We're going to make sure this is shared widely, not just among City Hindu Network, but also other professional bodies and through social media. I really want to thank you. And uh, thank you also for being an absolutely wonderful friend for all these years as well.